thank you so much thank for you. the invitation, Dr. Friedman, and to come here this morning to participate in this, uh, this I think, very important day. Um, drug addiction is, has been a huge problem on, um, on our society, and for me as a neuroscientist, the c critical thing is trying to provide knowledge so that we can treat and prevent. My research takes many forms, and a huge question to me when I first started studying addiction is, as many of you know, many people will be exposed to drugs, but not everybody goes on to have an addiction and psychiatric disorder, and the question is why. So the key thing is trying to understand why are these individuals over here so much more vulnerable? And to understand vulnerability, we have to look at it, at least from a neuroscientist perspective, from I want to know what the cellular changes are, the systems changes in their brain, to the behavior that then leads to, um, as I said, their, their psychopathology. I feel bad for the non-scientists in the room because I'm going to bring you back to your science high school and college uh, 101. Um, so some things um, just ignore your, your um, I won't test you on it in the end. For the students in the audience, I will in the postdocs. Um, so I'm going to give you, though, the punchline for basically what most of my talk is going to uh, be about. And basically, oh, yeah. Well, they can't see me, but I'm sorry. So um, the take-home message is going to be, how do we, as I said, how do we study um, what the neurobiology of addiction is? And I look at it from studying the actual human brain. So I study people. Unfortunately, addiction has a lot of death. And now with the opioid epidemic, you have even more um, overdose. Um, we study animal models that are really important to giving us causal relationships because you can study the... Which one's yours? This one. That one. You can study humans, and we see many different things, obviously, in the brains of humans, and, but the question is, does that really relate to the particular drug? And that's why animal models are really important in that regard. And that's not the one. Um, Charles Drew, 2014. Okay. Was over. Um, and then also, how do you take the neuroscience information that you gain to then try to develop treatments? That is the goal for us. Knowledge is essential for developing treatments. And I think the problem with addiction is that there's a lot of, everyone knows what addiction is, yet still we don't know. What is the neurobiology of it? Without having research to understand the neurobiology of addiction, we're going to go nowhere in being able to develop treatments and prevent. We're there. Okay, so as I said, this is going to be the take-home message. So basically, the vulnerability relates to your genetics, the environment under which you are exposed to various um, events, those two combinations impact the, the plasticity of your brain. And in particular, we see changes a lot within the synaptic plasticity, meaning how your cells communicate. And we're trying to identify the specific neural circuits in the brain that are relevant for that because that's what really mediates your behavior. I move my hand because a particular sets of neurons and the circuit that they're in allows me to do that. That's the same thing with addiction, that the neural circuitry that is important for the neurocognitive traits and the behavioral traits that really underlie addiction um, vulnerability. The one thing that is clear more and more is that all of this is impacted by stress. Stress impacts on a number of these systems so that even interacting with your genetics. And as I said, this is a take home message. The numbers for addiction, when you look at the, the drugs that m most people are dependent on, people are always surprised to see that marijuana is actually, uh, or illicit drugs, and now that the legality of, a, of marijuana, uh, medical marijuana, um, decriminalization, we will definitely have more research to, um, we're having big research now, in a couple of years we'll understand what it means since as more and more people start to um, use marijuana, but before even these, these laws had been lifted, marijuana was the drug, the illicit drug that more people were dependent on, and people are always shocked. They're like, you can't become dependent on marijuana, and that's not true. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, we, and a number of you have already mentioned, opiate um, dependence has become a huge problem in an epidemic, and not only in, in communities with low socioeconomic um, uh, 
populations. We have opiate epidemic now in very rich um, communities. So it's hitting everybody. So today I'm gonna really focus on these two drugs because that's where we have most of our neurobiological information and I hope to just give you some insights in what we've been finding. As I said, um, addiction risk is you take a drug, obviously you cannot become dependent on a drug if you don't get exposed to it. And so as compared to many other disorders that have a genetic component, and trust me, addiction has a significant uh, genetic component, but you have to be exposed to the drug. Even if you don't have that genetic risk, and that's why our animal models do come in very well, just the repeated exposure of, of a drug well, is changing your brain so that you start to mimic some aspects of people who already started off with a genetic risk. And the environment also then, like I said, comes into play. So I'm gonna focus in large part to, um, for the first two on the drug and the environment. And a couple of years ago, um, I did a study with, well actually I shouldn't say I, Yoko Nomura, um, who is a, a collaborator at Mount Sinai, she's an amazing uh, biostatistician, looking at a huge um, population that's, the data is used for um, the National Survey of Drug Abuse in the Pathway to Addiction. It's thousands of people and looking at what's the initiation of drug use in terms of can you look at different factors. When you look at the different drugs, whether it's marijuana or cocaine or heroin, one of the things that is clear is that early environmental um, insults such as child abuse impacts significantly the, their pathway to even initiation um, of the drug. Surveys are critical. Without epidemiological data, we, we won't get insights in terms of what are the key things we need to focus on. So looking at, for example, the national um, uh, monitoring the future, within the past few years, a shocking thing has become apparent in the US. More young people actually think that smoking cigarettes is bad for you, which is great because the, the marketing has worked um, that cigarette smoking is bad for your health. But there is now this blip that for the first time we have the switch that now cannabis use is more prominent in the US than cigarette smoking among these young kids. And if you look at high school students, um, 12th grader, more of them will have used marijuana than even cigarettes. So we definitely need to make sure that we do the same kind of due diligence in educating our young people about marijuana as we did with cigarettes because that did help to decrease the number of cigarettes use in the US. But as I said, we're now having this problem with marijuana. And it's really important because we still have very little information about the long-term impact of marijuana use on the brain. This is just, um, on the left side is just showing, actually it's a twin study um, that showed the, um, in a twin that has be became dependent versus the not the, the, their other twin that did not get a drug addiction disorder, what were some of the differences? And it was initiation of, of drug use early. So getting to people early is critical because if you can, if you can have people delay their onset of um, starting, um, so, so people who started smoking marijuana early they were much more um, at risk to becoming dependent on other drugs of abuse such as the opioids and, and um, psychostimulants the earlier they started versus their twin. The same thing is the, on the left side is across um, it, it a whole population study but just indicating the same thing. So if we can get into the populations earlier to at least delay their, their exposure our use of marijuana, it definitely decreases their vulnerability later in life. In addition to initiation, the frequency. Definitely daily use of marijuana in young people has a much more long-term detrimental effect in their vulnerability to addictive and psychiatric disorders um, later in life. So now for the science. So um, marijuana, binds to, or the, the psychoactive component in marijuana, which is THC, and it has a number of other cannabinoids in this uh, marijuana plant, they bind to a receptor, the cannabinoid receptor, the CB1 receptor in the brain. The cannabinoid receptor, the CB1, is the most abundant G-protein coupled receptor in your brain. It's the most abundant re receptor in your brain. It's not for smoking marijuana, it's for modulate, it's a major neuromodulator of synaptic communication. Um, these are 
are coronal sections throughout the human brain, and this is looking at the cells that express the gene. And um, I'm just going to orient everybody. These are the this is the cortical regions around here. In the middle is a region called the striatum, and the striatum integrates information, cognitive, motivational, reward, and um, has a motor outcome. And, um, and is really critical in addiction disorders. Um, down here you see the cerebellum, imp important for um, motor coordination, and the cannabinoid receptors are very strongly expressed in like the hippocampus here, which is important for memory. So you have a lot of cannabinoid receptors in the brain, and as I said, um, what, I, what is the importance for them for me was this whole aspect about early initiation of can cannabis exposure, and so we developed animal models where we could look at the exposure to THC during adolescence and look at them later in life. We've studied both human and animals. I'm showing you our animal models, for example, here, where we give uh, concentrations about a joint every third day, and then we look at the animals. The great thing about the animal models, a shorter time in their life, you can look at them, what happens in adulthood. And one of the, um, when you look at the developing brain, the prefrontal cortex is one of the last areas to develop. So many people think that they're adults by 18 or 21, depending on the, the age. Um, if you go to the military, I guess you're 18, uh, and 21 if you want to drink. Um, but the brain doesn't really fully develop until you're about 25, and it's the prefrontal cortex in terms of cognitive control that is the, la the latest to develop. And so we actually looked in the prefrontal cortex to see what does adolescent um, THC exposure have on the, the cortex. So here what we did was to measure, um, oh stop, I, I want to keep walking. We measure how the, the, the cells, um, the, the, the morphology, the structural um, organization of these cells. And I think you don't have to be a statistician to see that there were no significant differences when we looked whether in very close to when their last cannabis exposure was and when they were young adults. However, the thing that was quite fascinating is that even though the actual, um, uh, I'm going to come back to this. This was the length of their, I should have said, the, whether or not the length of, the tr of their dendrites and um, of the, how the cells look didn't change, there was a substantial fundamental difference in the branching, and branching of your neurons are important for synaptic um, uh, communication, and the complexity differed. So the black line indicates just the normal development of, the, of your, your cortical neurons, and the green line are those um, animals, these are adult animals who were exposed during adolescence to THC, and you can see that the adolescent THC changed the cortical branching of the prefrontal cortical neurons, which would definitely impact on, I'm gonna to try to give like a couple of summaries as for people who are not, so that it alters the structural development of your cortical um, uh, cells. Another important time period for, um, for the developing brain is obviously the prenatal time period. This is the cannabinoid receptor expression in the human fetal brain. And you can see something immediately different from what I showed you about the adult brain before. The adult brain, the cannabinoid receptor was, as I said, the most abundant G protein receptor in your brain. Here you can see it's much more concentrated. And these brain regions where it's most concentrated, I will tell you, for example, this is the amygdala here, the structure. Um, here we have also hippocampus, we have the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is a, is a critical brain region for reward. What they have in common is they're called the, the, the so-called um, mesolimbic, mesocortical limbic system, important for emotional regulation. And during, during in utero development, you have more of the cannabinoid receptors are expressed there in the human fetal brain. The important thing actually about um, the expression of the cannabinoid receptor, you don't really see when you look at the, the um, just the gene expression of where these cells are expressed. Because when we looked into, um, when your brain develops, you've, you've, you've formed these, I'm trying to think, the networks, 
your brain to develop, it tells these cells that it must, it should develop the, the cells that project into the cortex or into the striatum. And it develops the network and it, it builds your brain. The endocannabinoid system, your natural cannabis, your natural endocannabinoid system is critical for the pathways of forming those, those, um, the, um, those networks. In fact, the cannabinoid receptors are on, they're called the growth cone as the neurons find their way throughout the brain. So the endocannabinoid system is critical for hardwiring of the brain. So if the endocannabinoid system is critical for hardwiring of the brain during fetal development, and you have significant exposure to um, cannabis, you may change just the organization of those networks as they form. And so that's some of the things that we have studied. Um, you don't have to worry about um, uh, the, the, the genes here we're talking about, but one of the studies we did was just looking at the proteins across the entire known proteins that exist and try to find how did prenatal exposure to cannabis, was there any specific changes that we saw um, that we had in common? And one of the things that we keep seeing are these changes related to the cytoskeletal, again, the structural organization of the brain. And one of them in particular, I'm not even gonna bother to say its name, but this particular protein, we not only saw it in our animal model, but we were able to replicate it in human fetuses whose mothers smoke marijuana. So we know that in utero um, cannabis exposure does alter molecular substrates that are key for the connectivity and the circuitry on, in which our brain is formed. So, we know that, as I said, when you smoke marijuana, you have the potential to change, if you're pregnant, you have the potential to change the brain of your fetus at that time. What happens long-term? Because that basically is the question. The question isn't whether or not someone at a party smoked marijuana or did cocaine or whatever. The question is what are the long-term impact for their mental health that might lead them to have a psychiatric disorder such as addiction? So again, and animal models are really helpful for us because we can look at not only the brains and behavior, we can look at the brains and behavior that relate long-term into adulthood. When we do that, we can see that um, the cannabinoid receptors in the cortex from in adults with prenatal exposure, they have significant differences in their en endogenous cannabinoid system also, when you can measure the firing activity of cells, these are the actual functional activity of the cells in the adults that had the prenatal exposure to cannabis, we again see that there's impairment in um, synaptic plasticity. I, this is just a summary, I didn't give all the genes. We then looked across the, the, the genome at multiple, cell, at multiple genes, and we saw that the genes that are primarily affected in adults with prenatal cannabis exposure, they relate to uh, genes that are important for synap uh, neurotransmission um, at the synapse, so at synaptic connectivity. So for us, we see morphological we see physiological functioning changes of their cells and the gene expression that really indicates that there are fundamental differences in the, in the synaptic plasticity of adults with um, early developmental exposure um, to cannabis. So this is just a, the summary giving that the environment impacts on, I didn't show you the, I'm gonna talk about epigenetics, we know some of the mechanisms by which this occurs, but that synaptic plasticity is a key um, component of um, of the long-term impact, impact of uh, cannabis. So we can see cellular, we can see um, systems level changes. So what about behavior? So when I first started, a, a big question for us um, was, is this the so-called gateway hypothesis? Does early ex developmental exposure to cannabis really leads to um, enhance vulnerability to drug addiction later in life? And Clearly, there are a lot of caveats with looking at um, human data. A lot of the human data show that there's an association. Um, it doesn't have to be causal because many things um, relate to why someone might start using cocaine or heroin and they start with alcohol or cigarettes or cannabis. But the data there definitely shows in humans a greater association in the people who are, um, say, for example, heroin abusers 
they did start off, uh, had early, or had earlier exposure to cannabis. But the animal models can give you much more definitive. So we developed, um, we decided to study heroin and opiates in relation to um, the developmental effects of cannabis because they actually share a lot of the intracellular um, signaling mechanisms, how can cannabis works, THC works, and how opiates works. They share a lot of those uh, molecules. And so we th allow animals to self-administer the drug themselves so they control their own fate. So if animals then are exposed during adolescence to THC and you study them as adults, do they self-administer more heroin without their mother saying that's bad or their friends forcing them? They, ind they indeed do self-administer more heroin. And this, this, is re this um, data has been replicated up the wazoo. Um, can I say wazoo? Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, and the, the interesting thing is, well, I'm going to come back. If you look at prenatal effects on ad adult self-administration behavior, we had actually um, much more variability. And it was interesting. They don't differ in the overall um, amount of the drug they take. However, there was a huge difference in these animals. These animals, they would run to the lever that was associated with heroin much faster than their, um, their, um, their, their counterparts who were exposed to just vehicle placebo. So this is the, the time period to get to the first lever. They were very quick. So the amount total that they took of heroin was about the same, but they were very different in their sensitivity. And an interesting thing that we saw was that they were much more sensitive to stress. You could actually play with the animals. If you just give them a little stress, they will self-administer much more heroin. Um, the animals that were exposed to THC. Also, when they, they would seek out the drug, even when the drug wasn't present, but the environmental cues indicated to them that the drug should be there, they would seek out and try to get heroin much more than the, the normal animals. This is basically saying the same thing, so I'm just going to go. Also, it was tougher to, for them to, ex you can try to extinguish their heroin intake behavior. Um, and more normal animals, you can, um, are much quicker to extinguish their heroin seeking behavior than animals with prenatal, adult animals with prenatal THC exposure. I'm not going to bother to, except just to say that. So we know that developmental ex um, cannabis exposure, it does increase the sensitivity to um, opiate reward and, and condition place preference with morphine um, and some of the addiction related traits. Another thing that we saw was that they showed more depression like um, phenotype. Um, the, the adult animals with, um, here was prenatal THC for example. It's a classic model that animals are put into, it's called a, um, a uh, four swim test and it's actually the stressor itself. And as I said, the animals that had prenatal THC, they showed more of this depression-like phenotype. An interesting thing that we, we found was actually, as I said, this, um, this behavioral test, even though pharmaceutical companies use it to test for depression-like um, behavior, it's actually a stressor. And we found like weeks, months after these, the animals had been exposed to this one day, minute stress really, animals with prenatal THC exposure responded to that stress so that they would self-administer. Here we went to f for food, um, palatable rewarding food, which is chocolate. So yeah, I love it. Uh, <laughs> just like humans, they love chocolate. And the animals that had the prenatal, just the brief history of a stress, the stress exacerbated their their um, rewarding, um, seeking behaviors. And I'm not gonna show you, we did, look, we did a lot of different tasks and we see this over and over, so that there's an interaction between just having a, a, a later stress in their life that compounded with the fact that they were exposed in utero to, th to cannabis, to THC. So in, in their negative affective traits and reward traits. <laughs> So we know the synaptic plasticity, we know the behavioral effect in terms of stress seem to impact on all of these, and we see greater changes actually in, in behaviors more relevant to negative affect. So depression-like, anxiety-like, I didn't show you some of the anxiety-like traits. 
so we know the, some of the molecular targets. The question is, what are some of the brain circuits? As I said, our behavior is dependent on where those changes are occurring in the brain in what particular pathways, because they're the ones that mediate a behavior. <laughs> so for us, understanding the circuitry is really um, important. And so the people who want, don't want to listen to the science part they can, can, can cut here. So in terms of, we focus on an area um, called the striatum, since the striatum is really um, highly um, studied in addiction disorders. And it's important, as I said, for reward, um, a, a compulsive behavior, the habit formation, different parts of the striatum. And we know the molecular organization of the striatum. So that was really key. So for example, we know that even though there are different types of cells in the striatum, we know that certain cells that express these particular genes, they're called the dopamine D2. Dopamine D2 is a receptor that we see is impaired in most um, people who have substance abuse disorders. The question is always the chicken or the egg, is it genetics or is it the drugs that induced it? Um, and it also ex um, expressed specifically a particular um, peptide, um, an opioid called enkephalin, while other subsets of neurons um, express different dopamine receptors and different opiate peptides. And because we know the, the, the phenotype of these cells, we also know where they project. And, we, and therefore, we also know their behavior. We know that the cells that um, express the enkephalin and the dopamine D2, they mediate inhibitory control. So when you, while the other um, pathway, other cells, um, they mediate go facilitatory behavior. So if I want to, actually, um, both on a motor function and for cognition, the decisions we make. So one is for go behavior and the other one is for stop. And so it's called classically the go and no go um, kind of uh, um, behavior. And just to put a lot of data together, one of the things that we saw, which actually I found very surprising myself, when we looked both in um, fetal brains or in adults with um, adolescent exposure, we at least in the doses, because we looked at very low doses of, of THC, for example, we always saw impairments of those cells that pre predominantly were part of this quote unquote no-go pathway. So you see changes in the dopamine D2 and in enkephalin. And that framed a lot of our, actually, our, our hypothesis. Oh, this is just showing in human fetuses, not only can we see this in animals, but we see it in humans. We see it in human fetuses that their dopamine D2 is changed and also the enkephalin. And this is the genes that are expressed in their brains. And it correlates directly to how much m marijuana their mothers reported smoking. So we can correlate um, ingestion of the drug with actual molecular changes in the brain. The problem that we have, again, is knowledge. Does this give us any knowledge about causality? Are, is the THC really, really causing these changes that we had seen in, the, in our humans, and we know from our animal models, yes. But are they important to the behavior? Circuitry is behavior. And so what we do is that we can go in, we use um, viral vectors, and we can put them in the par parts of the brain that we're interested in, change the um, the expression of that gene in that particular pathway and see whether or not if you change the gene in that pathway, does it change the behavior that you're interested in? And so we did that, for example, with these animals. And we can actually play with their behavior. These animals have never, some of them have never been exposed to um, cannabis here in the blue line. But if we overexpress the enkephalin gene, for example, in those particular cells in that pathway, <laughs> they will self-administer more heroin. You can do the opposite. You can knock it down. You can bring down the expression of that gene in that pathway, and they will then, in the yellow line, decrease their heroin self-administration. So we know that that pathway and those genes are indeed very important to the drug-taking behavior. Um, I'm going to go past this just to, in, in, for time. And just to say that we use transgenic animals where we can block down just to show that that pathway indeed is important. So those are animal models. The question that we had is how do we now look at this in humans? So we know this pathway. We know the genes that they express. We know the behavior they should mediate. How do you do that in a human? We decided to use genetics. 
so your genes are obviously expressed throughout the whole brain, the whole body. It doesn't have to only be in these circuits, and that's one of the caveats. But interestingly, we are our genetics. That was one of the things that um, th this study showed. So we brought people into the lab, um, cannabis-dependent people and normal subjects, went them through a psychiatric and psychological batteries. We had them um, do certain tasks to look at their decision-making. Your decision-making, um, you think that you are, you, you decide on a lot of things, but this study really, and a number of other studies, not just um, this one, this is a, the first um, of a line of research that we were doing, it was very interesting that you think that, you know, the, my reward, the things that I find rewarding, or the things that I can't stop doing, that it's me, of course it's me, but in related to the genetics, even in the normal people. And here it's just the decision-making um, on reward um, tasks. I'm not gonna go through the detail of tasks, but basically your, abil your ability to choose something less rewarding versus ability to avoid something that is negative. And the gene, some of the dopamine D2 that's expressed in this inhibitory no-go pathway completed, completely predicted inhibitory control behavior decisions. However, I had expected that we were gonna see great impairment in the cannabis subjects, and we really didn't. And because I made a big error, I didn't think about what the cannabis subjects, who the cannabis subjects were. And this cannabis subjects actually had a lot of negative affect. They, they had, um, their neuroticism anxiety traits were off the charts. They were also impulsive, they had impulsive traits, and they had, as I said, a lot of negative affect. Even though the day of the, we didn't, we told them that they could still smoke marijuana, except for the day of the testing. Um, so it wasn't that they were in withdrawal from cannabis, because people going through withdrawal from cannabis is pretty strong. In fact, more strong than some other quote unquote hard drugs. So we didn't, cons um, we didn't consider their negative affect in our decision making tasks. When you do, then you see that indeed, cannabis subjects have impairments in their inhibitory control. Um, the important thing though, or one thing, was that we saw that the genetics played a role. And actually I'm gonna come back to that. It played a role in two, in two ways. That there, in people, let me just go this. I just put it, depending on the, there were, if you had a, a mutation of your enkephalin gene or your dopamine D2 gene, and you had a, a trait of negative affect, you were nine times, eight, nine times more vulnerable to being cannabis dependent. So many of, oh, I, I didn't emphasize, our control subjects actually had tried and smoked marijuana. They just never became dependent. So it wasn't that there were these pure people. People always, I'm a worse subject because I've never smoked marijuana, so it's very funny. And people are like, but you were born in Jamaica. I'm like, not all Jamaicans smoke marijuana. And when I, I told my friends I was gonna become an, a, an addiction researcher, they were like, Yasmin, but you've never tried anything. So they, were, they had all these things of trying to get me to try these drugs. So I was not one of them. So I am not a good control, and it's important to have good controls, because people who don't do certain things, you don't want them as a control. The control people had smoked marijuana. As I said, the difference was their genetics and the negative affect. And we, we replicated this in a Greek population of the men who go to, they have to go to military, and we, they do um, personality traits on them and so on. So the genetics and negative affect does increase your risk. So as I said, there's a synergistic um, contribution of genetics and your behavioral traits to who become dependent on cannabis. Since many teens smoke cannabis, but not everybody becomes dependent. So that starts to explain to us about vulnerability. So as I said, we know that negative affect is really critical. We know that um, it, your inhibitory control um, does play on it and a synaptic plasticity and a huge com component of stress. So I'm going to, wait, how much time do I have? I, oh, okay, perfect. So we know this line from prenatal. We know adolescent exposure leads to adult um, vulnerability. A question that I, I, I raised to people in my group, and in particular, um, one of the students who was doing the prenatal, um, Jennifer Denieri, said, what happens 
if you look at the next generation? And she said, yes, but I'm not going to do that study because I want to graduate. <laughs> and, um, and she was right. It was a bad study to tell her to do. So I luckily, uh, a, a postdoc, a new postdoc had joined the group, Henrietta Sutzeritz, and she said, I'm actually very interested in it because she's a molecular biologist who studies um, epigenetic mechanisms and development. And so we've been looking into does the quote unquote, what you did as a teenager impact your kids and their kids? And so in, again, in humans, that's very tough. So to look at the germline effects of THC, we did an animal model. The same thing as we did for adolescent um, uh, exposure. They meet as they get exposed to THC as adolescents. They fall in love when they're adults and they have kids, but somebody else raises their kids because just to take away the impact of potentially bad mothering. And we have looked now at their kids and their kids' kids and so on for a few generations. I'm only going to show you one generation. I'm going to tell you it lasts some of the things I will show you. The first thing that was very surprising is that these adults have never themselves been exposed directly to THC. It was their parents when their parents were teens. You will see that um, these males, they self-administer active lever means that you press the lever, you get heroin. They self-administer more heroin than the vehicle animals. They're also much, they show more stereotype behavior, um, uh, usually after heroin, animals and humans um, have these motor responses. They show more stereotype behavior. Um, they show um, sensitivity to the environment. I'm not going to describe what this particular test does, but just to say that they are different, not by anything that they had themselves, but from their parental um, exposure. We also know that there are gender differences. Um, we see certain things much, much more prominently in males than we do in females. The females show um, more depression-like uh, phenotypes from the first generation. The males, it comes after like the second and third generation. One of the things that we, again, to summarizing some of our work, we find that um, a lot of the genes related to the transmission of glutamate, synaptic plasticity, are changed, both in the, the expression of the gene, the function of the receptor, and again, when you do electrophysiological work and measure the activity of the cells, you can see that there are significant differences on the functional firing of their neurons. Again, they've never been exposed directly themselves to THC. So what we have done is gone on to try to understand what are the mechanisms? And these are what mechanisms not only maintain from prenatal and adolescent exposure to keep these molecular changes in the brain in these pathways that impact on behavior, we are now trying to understand how is it possible for your, um, your what your grandfather um, was exposed to impacts you and, um, and the fact that you're more anxious or more depressed why? And these are called epigenetic mechanisms because we know that they're not genetic. We know that it's an environmental impact and, the, and that environmental impact changes how the chromatin of their, their genes, whether or not the, the chrom their genes are tightly bound so they can't really make, synthesize that gene or whether or not it's open. And we have been trying to understand some of the mechanisms. I'm not going to give you the detail except for one important thing that we do see that DNA methylation is changed in these subjects. And the thing that's interesting about DNA methylation, and we see it, we've studied it across the genome, a number of the changes, again, come back to genes that are important for synaptic communication, the organization of the synapse. And so we're going into it now and trying to understand more. We also have gender differences that, so um, women and, and men, girls and boys are not the same as we know. And um, we see that more and more, and so we really need to study gender differences as neuroscientists uh, a lot more. But as I said, the fascinating thing to us is that a number of genes, and, and actually a number of these genes have been implicated in developmental disorders such as autism and, um, and even ADHD. So it's interesting that a number of these similar uh, 
the sim similar sets of genes are coming up um, over and over. And the, as I was saying, one of the things I find interesting about DNA methylation is that there is hope. Epigenetics is hope. Genetics are tough. You can change the, the things that you inherit. You can change, you can reverse epigenetic mechanisms. And methylation, so the animal model is great for, as I said, showing causality. But many, most humans, we have things in our lives that counter exposures to bad events all the time. A very nice, um, enriched environment. You're loved by your parents. That can counter certain things. As humans, the fact that women get folic acid when they're pregnant or take it, again, unfortunately, not every community, not every pregnant woman gets the same prenatal care. But folic acid actually counters these changes in DNA methylation. So the things that we see in the animals is just what's possible. The humans, where we do things that we don't realize can have already countered some of this. But not every woman gets the same prenatal care. So I am actually optimistic that yes, the animals show causality, but we can now go in and try to change some of these things. So wait, this was just showing, that, as I said, um, parental history causally impacts on the future. We see changes in relation to reward sensitivity and a lot of negative affect like depression-like um, symptoms and the changes that we see in synaptic plasticity. So um, overall, there is definitely a disruption not only during your lifetime but across generations um, for cannabis. So in this last little time that I have before I end, was then what is, what is the hope? So I just said marijuana does this, and we've had all these debates about um, the legalization of marijuana, decriminalization of marijuana, and medical marijuana. And I have to tell you, medical marijuana is a pet peeve for me because I think it's incorrect terminology. The marijuana plant has over 600 cannabinoids. THC is one of the um, is the most, uh, is the highest concentration in the cannabis plant. And over the years, people have grown cannabis that has high concentration of THC, hence probably one of the reasons that we are seeing more um, psychiatric problems. And, early, and that kids are starting to, to smoke marijuana earlier, because as I started off, the earlier in the initiation of marijuana use, that's what's really a big cause of the problems. But the plant is not medical. It's medical for certain components of the marijuana plant and for certain disorders. One of the things THC, as I showed you, that has a negative impact when it comes to the effects on drug abuse. There's another component of the marijuana plant that um, in recent years has gotten a lot of attention. Nearly 10 years ago, I tried to study it and we've now got traction. Um, it's called cannabidiol. On the street, Interestingly and unfortunately, um, over as they have made THC more concentrated in the plants, they've inadvertently decreased the amount of cannabidiol that's in these plants. And I, I call cannabidiol the, yang, the yin yang to THC because it has, it seems to have an opposite protective effect. So in contrast to when I showed you THC, um, THC enhances heroin self-administration, we see, I'm going to do the punchline, we see the opposite when it comes to ca cannabidiol. We know that THC promotes psychosis and even anxiety. Even though people will say, oh, I smoke marijuana to decrease my anxiety, actually it exacerbates it. So it's a self-medication that doesn't work. But it depends on the marijuana plant that they're smoking. We know from a lot of studies now, throughout the world actually, Europe and has done the most, that cannabidiol decreases psychosis in schizophrenic patients and decreases anxiety. So a question to us was, does, is cannabidiol, what's cannabidiol's effect on drug dependence? And unlike what we saw with um, THC, actually cannabidiol did not change heroin self-administration. It doesn't have any gross motor effects, and we actually uh, replicate what the Europeans have shown, that it's actually a pretty safe dr um, drug. One of the things that it did do, interestingly, it inhibited drug-seeking behavior in the animals. 
but, but in the drug-seeking behavior that was induced by the environment. So when there are environmental cues, cannabidiol in the blue decreased um, the self-administration in, in the animals. It also was very unusual just giving like one or a few injections of the drug to the animals, it lasted a long time. And we're trying to understand how that works, but that is really important in terms of trying to develop a treatment. So it had this protracted effect on um, the environmental cues that induced relapse. Importantly for us, many people are on methadone. And so in terms of is this gonna be effective, we also looked at methadone um, maintained animals, and methadone doesn't block craving or, or Q-induced craving. In fact, they will self-administer heroin just like that. But methadone plus cannabidiol does inhibit um, heroin-induced craving. So we're really optimistic that there may be a use, beneficial use of this particular cannabinoid um, from the marijuana plant for um, potentially treating um, heroin self uh, treating heroin dependence. This is just showing an, an interesting thing that we start to understand how it's working. Remember all the things I said that the developmental effects impacts on synaptic plasticity and glutamate. Cannabidiol actually normalizes the glutamatergic impairments that we see, for example, in the nucleus accumbens core and shell, or in the nucleus accumbens. So we're trying to understand, as I said, its mechanism, um, but we know that part of it is through normalizing, again, um, glutamate. So for me, a huge part of addiction and treatment is the fact that we don't have a lot of, of, of medications for a, an important part of the, the cycle of, um, that addicts go through. So for the intoxication withdrawal, craving is a huge part of the addictive um, uh, disorder. And so I feel that perhaps cannabidiol might be one of one, another tool for us to use in that arm. And that's one of the things that we've started. It took a while. We got FDA approval. Um, our, we got an NIH grant. And then it was tough getting marijuana, quote unquote, because people think of cannabidiol as marijuana. It says, therefore, schedule one drug, even though it has no rewarding effects. And it counters all the things I just told in terms of inhibiting um, uh, heroin seeking, at least, behavior. But we do have a schedule license, so it took a while. And there are no companies at that time in the US that um, were allowed to make cannabidiol. And there are companies in Canada and, and the UK, and we work with a company in the UK, and we, we've started our study. We did the first phase one, and we found, we studied like the pharmacokinetics, we studied normal subjects, we saw no. Um, significant, any um, uh, serious adverse effects. So with that said, um, just covering a broad scale of um, some of the work from our animal, cellular, molecular, and human, these are the people who carry out the work, um, and there's also a larger team. Um, Henrietta Sitzeris is, is the postdoc, like I said, who took on the challenge of the um, the transgenerational cannabis, and she now, she says she has a nervous breakdown from it, um, following the animals over time. Um, Claudia uh, Morris, and Ben Chadwick, uh, Michael Miller did a lot of the um, prenatal and, develop and adolescent exposure, um, and um, Michelle Yoon and a number of the clinical coordinators who carry out the, the clinical study. And I definitely thank um, NIDA a lot for all of their support in being able to carry out these, these studies. I'll take any questions. Thank you. So we have, um, so we have some time for questions. We'll start with them. Um, oh. oh, wait, no, give to them. To me? To give okay. to them. We'll start with um, questions in the audience here. But if, um, um, Dennis, you want to unmute the phones from distance, we can take questions remotely also, or? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the first question, though. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me go to you. Prerogative of the host. Yeah, exactly. Um, you talked about the prenatal exposure of marijuana. We talked about all the marijuana dispensaries going out. Is there any warnings given at marijuana dispensaries that if you're pregnant or getting pregnant, you should not use this, or there might be danger? And, I don't think so, at least 
At least Yourself. to my knowledge, um, I have not seen that. I think it's critical. In fact, the opposite. Some people um, think that marijuana, because it can help, quote unquote, with morning sickness, but that is a huge problem. And you, you see a lot of these sites saying, oh, marijuana is very good for pregnant women. And I, I think they really need to put a warning on. Mm -hmm. Oh, you had your hand up first. Like I said, yeah. <laughs> Very nice talk. I have a question. Uh, epigenetic study, MRI, CT scan, all are very expensive and it needs very special lab, lab, specialized labs. So what about some surrogate biomarkers, which is easy to collect, like from peripheral blood? You do the analysis, just you do for your truck concentration. and look at those markers and you are able to say, well, they have this much of depression, they oh, have this much, of, this much of craving, and this is their mental conditions, at least before sending them to any sophisticated lab. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, like I said, I really thank NIDA for allowing us to be able to do some of this work because a lot of it is expensive. And it is a goal of NIH and most scientists to try and find biomar peripheral biomarkers. And I will tell you that we're looking into that. The problem that we do have with finding biomarkers that may be specific to saying this particular pathway is impaired or so on is tough because they're cell specific. But we are looking, and a lot of groups are looking for biomarkers that are more general and perhaps, as I said, I think you have to start treating each individual based on an individual, their genetics and the environment. And so I think that that combination with some of their molecular marks, performant molecular marks, might give us much more insight into who may be better served by a particular treatment. I didn't go into a lot of our heroin um, studies in humans where just treatment based on genetics is critical. Just like the cannabis dependent people where the genetics was important, it will be that. So I think the, bio, the peripheral biomarks are really important, I agree. Thank you very much. Um, I think oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I really like this presentation. It points okay. out something that I've always been worried about. <clears throat> I've always thought that drug development has a way of promoting morbidity. You see, India hemp is an extract. It has a bunch of stuff in it. We start meddling with it. We yeah. increase the THC in it, and then get faced with all these complications. And then we found out, oh, yeah, CBD that can offset it. Why don't we do studies that test the entire extract? Because, you see, what we do is we create alternative markets. Right. And people trust us because we come with data, but the data is like this presentation now. I don't know what to think about marijuana. Should I be promoting <laughs> the it's, whole? If you're pregnant, don't do it. If you're a teenager, don't do it. If you're an adult, I don't know. <laughs> but, but you see, Maybe it's up to you. <laughs> but if you look at the data itself, what well, the data is. Right. Unless you're going to have kids and your grandkids, you know, then. The, no. So your point about studying the extract is very important. And there, there are groups that do study the extract itself. The problem that we have today is what California has. You have these dispensaries that makes your different types of plants. So unfortunately, we've bypassed the good old days. We're no longer where the plants have been changed. They're no longer those plants that existed in the past when people in the 70s and 60s, you know, the peace love uh, generation. It's a different marijuana plants that are out there. And so when you say to study the extract, it's, you're going to have to study the extract of many, many um, strains of the plant. But your point is, is absolutely correct. We'll take a question remotely. Is that anything remote? From the, from the um, online. online, anybody? Um, really breathtaking um, presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a medical sociologist, so not so much familiar with the molecular or genetic makeup of, of you know, the causality relationship. But what has registered in my mind from your presentation is that um, 
for the for the tra for the trauma patient, adolescent pro trauma patients who are uh, who physician administer opiate for pain management. So I'm thinking that genetics and that. So how would you explain that? Yeah, I'm. I, I do think that um, as we increase the, 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 the medications in our quote unquote toolbox, we'll be able to have better individualized treatments because there are some people who shouldn't get opiates as their for pain management, but there are other things that they can get. But at the end of the day, your patient comes first. So if they are suffering, you have to help them then and there. We need to have. Um, assays, quick assays, cheap assays that we know that there are certain genes now from different studies have replicated very well that these genetic, um, these mutations increase your sensitivity. And they should be able to use it. Any, any clinician could quickly say, oh, you have this particular genetics, you should actually get this, not this. That is the goal. Hopefully, I really hope that we use science and what we have learned and tax dollars have gone into paying for all this work to use it to impact care and treatment. And, and those are the things that I think would be really important. Question mm -hmm. from the row? No. No. Thank you. Dr. Hurt, uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Uh, for my simple brain, this was well above my understanding. Um, you definitely fired my glutamate transporters as, as well as my <laughs> cannabinoid receptors. Uh, I have an interest, so it's kind of a peripheral, and I would love to hear your comments on this. As you know, for cancer patients, there's a lot of discussion about whether they should be getting cannabinoids as a prescription drug. And there's also a concern that many of the cancer patients who are on chemotherapy go through significant cognitive changes uh, over the course of time, even after the withdrawal yeah. of the chemotherapeutic drugs. So I'm sort of kind of a little confused. How do we select patients or do we recommend patients without knowing the cognitive changes that they are going to go yeah. through during chemotherapy and even after chemotherapy and recommend them for cannabinoids? Thank you. Yeah, um, I know that there are a number, uh, or I shouldn't say, not a few preclinical laboratory studies that are being done with um, looking at chemotherapy in combination with cannabinoids on cognitive behavior. We need more of those studies because you're right, the, we don't know who's going to have a worsened outcome. I actually still come back down to the, the, the bad term of medical marijuana. I think we have to get to the actual chemistry. So is it THC? Is it cannabidiol? Because cannabidiol actually also has positive effects in terms of decreasing um, cell growth in cancer, proliferation. And so cannabidiol might be the better. I didn't show some studies. Um, the cannabidiol actually improves cognition in contrast to THC. So if those studies are done with cannabidiol, I think there may be some benefits there. There are other components of the cannabis plant than, than cannabidiol that also appear to be very effective and that a number of the chemists are working on now. So there, there's hope, I think, down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. This is really great presentation. We all learned a little bit. Yeah, I like it. Okay, so uh, one, one of the questions regarding endocannabinoid is uh, it directly targets some of the key regions in the brain which controls the satiety and the food requirements. So that's, that's another aspect when we are uh, considering about any uh, use. So the other aspect obviously goes side by side, right? And I have another uh, question and comment, like looking at the chemical structure of this THC and this cannabidiol, the only difference is just a sim simple re reduction. Yep. So it makes wh a big wh difference. while these uh, properties are completely different, so when you are following up the pharmacokinetics, are you at any point, because the TSC requires simply a plain reduction to be conver converted to cannabidiol. So during that uh, like time course of study, do you see any interconversion no, between these two? No, it doesn't get converted to THC. That's, no. No, THC converted to... No, it can does I, no, okay. no, we don't, yeah. But food intake size is very important. One of the things are actually the first generation after 
um, we see changes in body weight in the, the next generation, but it doesn't last into um, the future generations, but it lasts in terms of changing their body weight or so their food intake. Um, and again, we see gender effects for, for that. So metabolism is very key in that. Uh-huh. One more question, final mm -hmm. question. Uh oh. <laughs> I think that said thank you. No. <laughs> Hello, as a lay person with a family of um, users of marijuana, what's with the red eyes? Why haven't we had developed anything <laughs> to get the red out of the eyes? And how does that happen that some, it continues forever? And we'll talk after. Oh, okay. <laughs> But thank you all very much. <laughs>